Well, after uh, that uh, announcement this morning, I'm only 20 years away from 80. I'm just glad to be here today with all of you. And uh, we're, we're, we had a bit of a family gathering over Friday night and yesterday, and some of my kids had to get back to their churches to minister this morning. Uh, but we had a good time and uh, um, just kind of celebrating my birthday. They, they uh, put on a kind of a PowerPoint, and uh, I'd forgotten a number of things, uh, you know, that uh, I did in times past that they reminded me of. Uh, and, it, and it was just a, a great blessing. And so um, very thankful for my family, for this church family, um, as we uh, continue to journey together in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me pray for us. Father, as we pray today, we thank you for these messages on uh, biblical womanhood and biblical manhood over today and, and next week. And then, Father, we're also looking forward to the youth a retreat that's upcoming. We want to pray for that. We also pray, Father, for those in our congregation who have been going through a grieving process as well. And uh, we just pray that as we minister to one another and encourage one another in the things of Christ, Lord God, that you would just bring incredible unity in our midst and continue to watch over those that are um, in our country where there's uh, splits and disunity and so much going on. Father, I thank you that you can bring things together as people surrender their lives to you. So we just pray that you bless us now as we um, continue in your word and uh, center our lives on your word and are led by the Spirit of God today. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. I remember back in um, my teenage years, which were many years ago, that uh, the, the group I sang with out of our church in London, Ontario, was asked uh, to sing at the Women Alive Conference in London at the London Convention Center at that time. It's a very interesting thing. I've been to men's conferences and, and women's conferences. There's, there's a big difference between the two. Women's conferences are so nurturing and loving and caring, whereas men's conferences are more like the NFL coach who is behind 20 points with his team at halftime and goes in and just kind of coaches and yells at them to do better. But I remember that particular day was a Saturday and we were to sing two sets of our songs. And I, I remember the first set particularly because the, at the Women of Live conference, um, Mel Na Maxwell, who was the head of it, a good friend of my mother's too, sat all of our mothers right in the front row, right in front of us. As we got up to sing, they just started crying. After the first set, women were crying. Then we went off and they had a speaker and then we came back in to do our second set. They were all crying more. And I thought, man, we're in, in deep trouble here. I mean, are we singing that bad to, you know, bring this about? But there was a lot of difference between what I saw at a men's conference and what I saw at a women's conference, which showed the, I think, the, the strengths that God builds into both men and women that he created. And I'm so glad that I've had godly women in my life, those women who have been transformed by Jesus Christ. And to be honest, this week I've been thinking a lot about my mother, uh, my grandmothers, and I'm thankful for my godly wife Gwen and my daughters and so many women over the years who have served with me on our staff teams and have been such wonderful example, examples of biblical womanhood, plus so many others within those congregations that I saw very clearly love the Lord Jesus Christ. So then you might be asking the question, why am I teaching on this, a male? on biblical womanhood this morning. Uh, you might be thinking, this guy is crazy. Okay, I am. But at the same time, whether it's me speaking here today or another godly woman speaking here today, the scriptures are very clear about what biblical womanhood and biblical manhood are all about. You cannot have an authentic Christian faith 
without biblical sexuality and understanding what biblical womanhood and manhood are all about, especially in light of today's culture where there is so much division. This is part of a Christian worldview. And today and then next week, we're going to look at these two subjects of biblical womanhood and biblical manhood. Femininity and gender are complex subjects within our culture. We cannot sum up femininity with one verse on submission or another one on equality out of the scriptures. Every, there are key passages in the Bible that are our starting points. But at the same time, we need to un- understand kind of the, the theology of the whole word of God, God's definitions, his laws, his narratives, the stories of godly women within the scriptures, and the repeated patterns we see throughout the Bible. And not only to hear what God says when he devi- defines womanhood, but also watch closely how he uses gender truth in his whole revelation. Gender issues are gospel issues today. God made human beings to be male and female. And that shows up in biology, and DNA confirms this, and this is good science, that there are male and female. The Holy Bible, the Holy Scripture, gives us the key understandings how God created us, to be men and women. And today's, the, the thought that I want us to understand, especially in, the, in light of biblical womanhood, is this. Whether single or married, godly women find their true identity and worth through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Whether single or married, godly women find their true identity and worth through a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you take your Bibles and turn with me to Genesis chapter 2, And Genesis is a very important book that I believe, I think what's happening within our culture particularly, uh, that Christians once again have to understand the foundations that God lays out about being a a biblical man, a biblical woman, about family, marriage, all of those things, because Genesis is the foundational scriptures that brings all of these things together. And right from the outset, the book of Genesis clearly says that God created the heavens and the earth. And so that's a a biblical foundation that is necessary to see that God created the heavens and the earth. As a result, he then creates uh, marriage and the family and the importance of that so that our society is stronger and not weaker by the things that come our way. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18 says, The Lord God said, It is not good for a man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, took one of the the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord made a woman from the rib that had been taken out of the man and brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and the two became one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. And in the design of God, we see very clearly that God's design there was that they would feel no shame. And because of the fall, we see the the issues that come out of this. But in Genesis 2, 18 to 25, this section records the creation of the first woman and the institution of marriage. So it's very clear that this was a mainstay of Israel's society, the people of God, especially in the Old Testament. This also carries over into the New Testament. And God intended husbands and wives to be a spiritual, 
functional unity, that we're walking in integrity, serving God and keeping his commandments together. And when this harmony is operative, society prospers under God's hand and his blessing when this occurs. Now, Adam was alone and that was not good. All else in creation was, was good. And as the man began to function as God's representative and, and starting to take dominion, it, it, he represented his dominion over those things. But, but God knew that the, this man was alone. And as a result of this solitude, God put him to sleep, created Eve from his flesh and bone, and the creation of God was not complete until Eve was created. God decided to make a helper suitable for him. Now, in my notes and in, in my study this week, this word helper, I have about three pages of notes just understanding this particular Hebrew word. And this helper is not a demeaning term whatsoever because we see in Scripture that God is called our helper. God Almighty is called our helper in a number of places. And then in the book of John, Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit being our helper. And because of this, it shows that the man lacked. His aloneness was not good. And as a result, his wife supplies what he lacked and vice versa. And Adam and Eve were a spiritual unity at that time, living in integrity, living holy without sin. And so there was no need to instruct them on a number of things. But then Paul, as a result, later discusses this relationship in order for us to understand that through Jesus Christ, we can have wholeness and unity in marriage again because both men and women sinned. And as a result of the consequences of sin, families have broken up. All of those kinds of things that have gone on, but Christ wants us to have these face-to-face -face relationships. And if you notice something about Genesis, that it was, it, 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 God wants to have relationships with his uh, creation face-to-face. -face. And he wants us to have face-to-face -face relationships within our marriages and within our families where there's nothing dividing us. Now, between services, I had a bit of a discussion with a couple of people about this because within our society right now, we see division on every side, right? And there's truth on every side. But I was reminded yesterday that in Joshua chapter 5, as Joshua is leading the people of God, he has a decision to make. But as he's going to Jericho, the angel of the Lord, the Lord himself, stands with a sword in front of him, and Joshua asks a very important question. He says, what side are you on? And how does the angel of the Lord answer him? He says, neither side. Neither side. Because when there's division and disunity, whether it's in our society or whether it's in families, that's not of... God. And Joshua submits himself to the authority of the angel of the Lord at that time, and then they're able to go into Jericho. And then we see him uh, as well, when you study the, the life of Joshua particularly, there's a point in time where he's standing before the whole nation. And what does he say? He says this, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord serve the Lord. It's a good example for us too in the family. When there's division, when there are things going on where we have to make decisions and, and, and where we're almost taking sides, that is not from God. Did you hear me say that? So what does God want us to do? He wants us to seek him. Now it's interesting that there have been many times in my life in married life with Gwen, especially early on, I didn't get it that she had the gift of wisdom. And I thought I could make all the decisions. That's not what God desires. And as we talked, as we prayed, as we sought God together, that's when we saw God at work the most. Because he was giving us wisdom into the situation. And most recently, we had to get a vehicle 
we realize we're not buying a new vehicle. We're going to get a, get a, an, another vehicle, and we needed wisdom about that. I wanted a big truck. She wanted a smaller car, and we prayed and compromised and found something in the middle. It's better for us and a better answer. And so the key scriptures that kind of correspond with this are also found in Ephesians. And we saw that Ephesians 5.21 is really, whatever relationships we have, we are to have relationships of respect as followers of Jesus Christ. And so we see in our culture people on every side, and there's a lot of disrespect flying around. But in Ephesians 5.21, it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And the Apostle Paul is reminding us there that as a follower of Jesus Christ, my life has to be centered in Jesus Christ. And that marriage, as the Bible talks about it, where a man and a woman have equal standing but different roles, it's very clear that this is all tied back to Ephesians chapter 1, where we have every spiritual blessing in Jesus Christ. And so what happens later from Ephesians 5.22 on does not make sense unless both people know Christ in marriage and are following Christ. And there are those within our congregation where one person is saved and the other one is not. That, That presents division at different times and that takes godly men and women in those particular marriages to live and influence for Christ. And we talked a little bit about that um, last week. Equal standing, different roles. And, and there's a biblical theology of femininity and also masculinity. Uh, Barbara Moser and her husband, I believe it's Bill, ha- have really been good scholars about this. And she has a book called Five Aspects of Women, A Biblical the- Theology of Femininity. And then her husband has wrote, written a companion book as they look at the scriptures and understand what God says about each place and each person in that place. See, the greatest need of a woman is secure love. That's what we find in Ephesians 5, where the man is to lovingly sacrifice and lovingly serve his wife and sacrifice for his life as Christ loved the church. Women feel secure when their fathers, their husbands, their brothers have their best interests at heart. And there are examples of this in Scripture. In Judges chapter 1, Caleb, who was one of the 12 spies that survived and and went through the generations in the, the wilderness, after God gives him his inheritance, his daughter comes to him, and he gives her a, a whole bunch of land as well as his daughter, which kind of breaks a whole number of things that she had an inheritance from her father. She then comes and asks him for some springs and some other things, and to bless her, he gives them to her. Which builds an incredible secure love in that relationship. Women who love the Lord and His Word seek to obey and glorify God. We see this in the life of Esther. We see this in the life of Ruth. We see this in Deborah the judge. These are all women who love God and His Word and are seeking to obey and glorify Him when so many people around them were not. And then we also see women who communicate in a healthy way that just build healthy relationships. And we see this with Priscilla, particularly in Acts, where Priscilla and and, and Aquila are dealing with Apollos. They are sharing the gospel with him. They have teamed together and they are ministering together. And as a result of that, there were so many people that no doubt came to Christ through the ministry of Apollos and them and the Apostle Paul because of this incredible way in which they built a healthy relationship with each other. We have so many women in our church who are godly examples in the family, in their marriages, uh, as they run businesses and are in the community. And, and, And as a result of that, there's such an influence as a result of those lives that are given over to glorify God no matter what station God has put them in. And godly women need to be led by godly men in the church. And there is no woman here or no woman I've ever met 
as I've said, do you want to have a godly man lead in, in your family and in your marriage where you are cherished, where you are loved, where, where you are protected, where you are provided for, and where you're nurtured, nurtured as a woman in your individuality and all of those things? Do you want someone like that in your life? And I've never said any, I've never heard no from anyone. And this is an important aspect that we'll get into next week. But there is a warning at times, too, where women, you are to grow in your spiritual life, but the, the warning is this, that as you grow in your spiritual life, do not become spiritually superior in your own minds or your attitudes towards your husband. Even if they do not know the Lord, believe this, that you are to submit and to be a person that's loving them so that they grow up in Christ as well. Because at times, one of you might be stronger spiritually than the other. That's just part of how life goes. And, and, and women have a natural desire to run their homes and families well, but that desire can often turn into a sense of control when their husbands maybe are not leading well in the home or taking their responsibility as well. And this issue a, a biblical submission or respect is one area in which God will allow that sense of control to be tested and challenge. And what often happens as people try to take control away from trusting God and those things is that we become very self-centered. But are you willing to let go and trust God even in this area of mutual submission and respect? See, submission in marriage does not mean, or respect in marriage does not mean breaking each other. Because I've heard at different times where a husband says, well, you know, I'll make her submit. Or, or the wife has said, you know what, I'll change him into what the image I want a husband to be. As true submission, submitting to one another out of reverence of Christ is not breaking each other. Submission is not suppression where one partner uh, suppresses the other's individuality or talents. Uh, women submit willingly to the sacrificial servant leadership of her husband and a godly man will also mutually submit to a woman who respects him and loves him in that way. A godly man cannot make a woman submit. In fact, that's not what the Bible says. It says the woman is to submit, that's her responsibility. And man is to lovingly sacrifice for his wife. Submission is not being passive or feeling inferior, either one. Or just submitting only when you think that he or she is right. Submission is not violating scripture, reason, or morality. And neither is it to manipulate or get your own way. When Gwen and I were talking about this message, uh, she reminded me wives are called to submit to their own husbands, not to other men. That, that's an important statement. Submission is really trusting God to lead and, and guide your husband. And all believers are to submit to governing authorities, treating them with respect. And all believers are to submit to Christian leaders in the church who are truly walking with the Lord. That's clear in Scripture. In his Chip Ingram's book, Marriage That Works, and I had, a, I think, a couple piles of these books, and I, I, I don't think there's any left out there. But he says this in this book, and I think we'll order a few more. It says, a wife is to step into the marriage relationship, not to step over her husband with strength and respect. She's an equal partner, a partner who submits to the righteous leadership of the other partner, her husband. See, a good leader or an honorable man, a godly man, wants a partnership with his wife to bring her strengths, thoughts, gifts, and even her best arguments to the table so that their marriage and fa family prospers. And so this morning, there are three kind of applications that I want to lay out for us that are also the reverse for the men next week. And these three priorities kind of laid out in Chip Ingram's book, and, and, and I learned them, you know, just from biblical study. They're there, and they're very clear. But these three priorities are important, nurture, protect, and provide. 
And a woman's three priorities are exactly the opposite order of a husband's. The husband's first priority is to to provide, protect, and nurture. And the wife's first is to nurture, protect, and then provide. And uh, he gives some definitions of this that are very helpful. He says to nurture, whether a man or woman, is to create a a relational environment that promotes the spiritual, emotional, and physical welfare of those around you. To protect means to minimize the harmful influences that affect the lives that have been entrusted to you. And to provide means to maximize all spiritual, emotional, physical, and financial resources to do good to those who are in your relation, relational network. Uh, he uses relational network. I like to say family and the home. But to the women, to nurture healthy relationships. How do you do that? Well, first of all, by making time with God daily to pray and, and plan and honor the Lord with the hours that God gives you each day. I mean, we see this in Proverbs 31.30. And uh, I'm going to reference a number of verses here in, in Proverbs 31. There might be so, uh, some people here rolling their eyes at me this morning while I'm using Proverbs 31. Because Proverbs 31, I believe, has, have been used in the wrong way in many sermons or even teaching that I've heard from women online uh, about this particular scripture. Because it's not there to bring guilt to anyone. It's actually there to encourage you to be free in the Lord. And there are a number of people that are just free in the scriptures. Joshua is one. He says, basically, as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. You see this in Esther's life, Ruth's life, and then you see this as well in the description of this woman, Proverbs 31, where she is just free to serve the Lord in so many different ways. In verse 10 says, a wife of noble character who can find, she is far more worth than any rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. And notice verse 12 of Proverbs 31. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. What a description that is. Someone who nurtures. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. And Proverbs 31, 30 says, and we we looked at this, charm is deceptive, beauty is fleeting, But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised, who is in awe of the Lord, who respects the Lord, who's following the Lord is to be praised. That's a nurturing person. And then we understand that we are to protect our most precious relationships. Protect. Protect your time for the priority relationships God has given you. Pray and model Christ-like dependency under challenging circumstances. We see this. In fact, in Proverbs 31, 23, it says, Her husband is respected at the city gate. Why is he respected at the city gate? Because she respects him. And she is helping build him up in light of others. And we'll see this as well for those that are married and how the husband can do the very same thing. But sometimes the right choices are the hardest ones, especially in young families. And Gwen and I have been there, right? I mean, yesterday I had a two-year-old coming at me almost all day, without exception, before dinner, and she's coming at me, she says, I'm going to eat you, chief. And she's coming at me like a little dinosaur, right? And she's faking biting me. And I saw her teeth, and I'm going, I'm so glad you didn't bite me, right? And, 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 and you see this, uh, what I saw yesterday was the, the protection of the, the, our family and seeing God's protection in our lives as we followed him. And, and, and I've also seen the, the decision people have to make, sometimes very, very hard choices have to be made, but the right choice is to honor God to protect our family. And we've had to do that as well over the years. This word helped me in the Genesis account or companion or partner is such an important aspect for us to understand. As I said earlier, it's not a demeaning thing. This is an associate, someone who is closest to you that makes all the difference as you kind of move forward as a family. In fact, Proverbs 31 
Verses 25 to 26 really kind of lays it out here for us, right? It says, she is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. That's a, that's a person of faith. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. Strength, dignity, wisdom are all evidences of a godly woman. And, and, and that, 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 those actions. She can laugh at days to come. Why? Because she's clothed with this strength and dignity that God gives her. And she speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction on her tongue. I often think about this and I've thought about this a lot this week. Where I remember my mother would pray with us before we went to school. And she'd st- just stand at the door. And I'll be honest, since my mom's passing, I've had that dream three or four times where she's just standing at the door. Now, I remember it from back then. That dream is there, right? I go to that house today. There's a garage there, and so she's not, she couldn't stand at that door anymore. But I remember coming home, and she'd be watching for us too. And I, I'm, I'm reminded this, you know, of those old castles where there's an archway and there's a keystone there. At the top, holding the weight of many things. And the archway was a place that people guarded so that nothing could come in, evil come into their home. Women have such an intuitiveness. Guys have kind of like a one-way track. And then women can see a whole number of things because God designed them to think with both sides of their brain. Did you know that? And so often, we forget this within our homes. And they are there to help to protect. And they are there to help to provide. Provide to make a difference for the glory of God. All these verses, all these things are in the notes as well. But look at Proverbs 31, verses 13 to 22. It, it, it's not, these are not verses that say women are to be doing all of this. This is not what it's saying. Because th- this is kind of that, that context from the past. But I don't know a lot of women in verse 13 who are selecting wool and flax these days. Okay? Or she's like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. But I know a lot of women who are getting up while still in the night to provide for their family. Verse 15. I know a number of women who are considering a field and buying it. And out of their earnings they plant a vineyard. Not only are they helping to manage the home with their husband. But they're also helping to manage the business. And I'm so glad I have a wife that helps to manage the business. I remember I think it was after the birth of Mary. I decided that it would be best for me to pay all the bills and give Gwen a break from managing the money. Well, we soon got notices that I hadn't, I'd missed a few bills, right? Because my strengths are in certain areas of business. Her strengths are in other areas of business as a result of understanding the gifts that God has given to us because we are opposites in so many different ways. When we bring those together, that's when the strength of God comes in because we are doing things together out of our strengths. And you see this description here. It's such a powerful description that she provides to build up the family, right? And you see, you know, when some people are minimizing the contributions of women, do you know what Jesus does to that? I'm reminded of the story in Mark 12 where this widow comes along to give to the treasury of God and she gives all that she has when those around her are mocking her because they've given such great amounts. They have not given all that they have. She has. Jesus sees it. So never think, women, that that your contribution is small. It's actually large in the eyes of God to provide and build up the family of God. During this COVID time, families have been driven apart because people have taken sides. It's a very difficult thing. 
And, and, and I've seen this and I've counseled with people and talked with people about this. It's a very difficult thing. But as I said before, when there are sides, whether in marriage or our family or in the community, neither side is, is more important than the other in God's sight. They have to bring things into the middle and they have to allow Jesus Christ to be king over it all. And that's when God's answers start to come about. Because there are good things sit on this side, good things sit on this side, there's evil being done on this side, there's evil being done on this side, and guess what? God's not either in on either of those sides. But COVID's also done something else. And I've heard it time and time again. Uh, God's used this time to change our family, bring us back together. We've been doing so much apart from each other. We've been so busy that we've kind of got back to priorities that honor Christ. We're just like Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. When there's humility before God like that in families, that's when God is at work. And it's interesting, too, that women are to provide godly mentorship to younger women as well. Titus 2, 3 to 5. That's such an important thing. And more than ever in our culture, we need godly women to mentor younger women as well and help them understand how valuable they are to God and how valuable they are when they live godly lives before God because those lives can change nations. So we provide to make a difference for the glory of God. And there's so many more responsibilities that women carry on in our culture and in our families. But the key thing is, whether single or married, godly women find their true identity and worth through a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's where they have a heart for God and they truly have a heart for others. And notice how the writer of Proverbs finishes this off. In verse 31, honor her for all that her hands have done and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. Isn't it interesting how he says that this woman helps her husband to have praise at the city gate. And as a result of that, that her husband is to honor her at the city gate and bring praise because of what she's been able to do and what they've been able to do together. We have many examples. I pointed out a couple this morning in the first service and just older couples within our church that, you know, they would say they do not have a perfect marriage because they are imperfect people, but God has used them in different ways to be an influence together in their families, in this community, and even beyond that. And when we understand what true biblical womanhood is and true biblical manhood is, it can change society from a society that is broken up and fighting each other to a society where there's peace and grace and love and when there's two sides, God can bring them together. But it takes strong families to do that. And that's why this is such an important time for us to understand what the Bible says about biblical womanhood and biblical manhood more than ever. Not people giving lip service to it and treating people wrongly, but people where they're surrendered to Jesus Christ, each of them walking hand in hand to glorify God in everything they do. That's what it's all about. Let's pray together. Father, may we who are married and in families here have a view of things that's biblical and from a Christian worldview. My prayer, Father, is that you would help us all to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, whether we are in a family or whether we're in the church. Father, I also pray 
that we would submit to governing authorities too. You call us to do that. With respect, Lord, mind you. And also to speak our peace, speak, our, speak truth, but to do it in a way that shows the love and grace of God. And Father, governing authorities too need to start showing grace as well. And Father, maybe we're here in a marriage where it's kind of like we're on two sides. Father, I pray for healing. I pray that Christ would be central, that he would be king, Father, in those situations as well. And that your healing would take place and that we would obey you, Lord Jesus, and submit ourselves to you first and foremost. And then, Father, that you would bring that unity and that peace that you can give as two people submit themselves to Christ. And Father, as individuals too here today, may our lives be caught up in following you. And Lord, like Joshua did with his wife and family that particular day, yeah, there is a line in the sand. But the line in the sand is to follow you or not to follow you. That's the bottom line, he said. So for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Amen.